Hello, everyone. It's one o'clock. We are ready to start and welcome. Welcome to our virtual avocado field day at Cal Poly. My name is Claire Ballant. I'm the direct, interim director for the Center for Sustainability. Here, can you hear? Can everyone hear me? Um, yes, great. Um, we are recording. Um, I'd like to thank all the organizations that made today's webinar possible. The California Avocado Grower Society, California Avocado Commission, California Department of Food and Agriculture's Healthy Soils Program. Hello. And most importantly, um, thank you to Ben Faber from the UC Ag and Natural Resources, um, who will be moderating our question and answer today. Um, we have five video segments today um, that we're presenting and special shout out and thanks to Dr. Moses Mike and his students at the Brock Center for Ag Communications for making these beautiful videos we'll be presenting today. Each is 15 minutes or less. Um, and after each video, we will have a brief uh, about five minute question and answer session. Um, and we will also have time at the end. Um, for more discussion and questions. Uh, for your questions, please put them in the chat when you are ready to do so. And if you can, um, say who the question is for so that we can get the questions to the panelists. They will also be monitoring the chat. So we'll have a free form mm -hmm. conversation also within the chat box. Um, and we'll try to get to as many questions as we can during the meeting. And if we cannot get to all the questions, we will post more answers to um, the questions we didn't get to um, and email those out to the registrants. Um, thanks again to all our wonderful presenters. Um, and with that, I'm going to hand it to Ben. Okay. Um, we have quite a few sponsors for this. Um, we have our uh, foundational sponsors, Delray Avocado, Index Fresh, Mission Produce, Nutrien, Westpac Avocados, uh, Westphalia Fruit, Calavo, and American Ag Credit. Um, and then we have these special event sponsors for today's meeting, which is Yara, Westbridge, uh, Abitopia, uh, Giamara Eco Farms, and CMAR General Engineering, who were instrumental in building the berms that uh, you'll, you'll be hearing and seeing about. Um, these videos will be available on the Avocado Society website, and any of your questions that are um, put into the chat will also be available on, on the California Avocado Society website. So with that, we will start off with uh, Gabe Philippe and um, Blake Petrucci talking about how they prune avocados. And listen closely because you may or may not agree with what he's doing or what they are doing. They've managed the, the, the property, the avocado property at, um, at Cal Poly for several years now. Um, so with that, we'll turn it over to Gabe and um, Blake. All right. Well, thank you, Ben. Are you going to start the video or did you want to, us to introduce ourselves? Um, well, there you are, Senior Director of uh, California Sourcing and Farming, and Blake's the, the manager of the Central Coast um, Farms and the mission is um, managing. Okay. I just wanted to preface by saying, you know, these are just our opinions. Uh, there's, there's a lot of approaches that we didn't cover in this video. Um, a lot of what growers should do is going to be dependent upon their tree size, their tree age, and their financial situation. So you ask five different growers, you know, how should I prune? You're going to probably get five different opinions. So I just wanted to start with that and uh, be willing to answer additional questions later on. Okay, great. Thanks, Gabe. And I will go ahead and start the video. Thanks.
My name is Gabe Philippe. I'm Senior Director of California Sourcing and Farming for Mission Produce. Uh, we are a, a global packer shipper, the largest in the world. Uh, we have distribution centers around the U.S. and uh, packing houses uh, around, the, around the globe. Uh, this operation here is a joint venture with Cal Poly State University. It's a long-term partnership that we went into with Cal Poly. Uh, it's been a very successful operation. We've managed to sustain yields of around 18,000 pounds per acre here, year in, year out. Um, and I'll let Blake introduce himself. Hi, I'm Blake Petrucci. I'm the regional farm manager for Mission Produce in San Luis Obispo County. So I manage three different ranches, one here in San Luis Obispo and two a little bit farther north in Cayucas, totaling about 170 acres. And I manage the day-to-day -day operations of all the uh, duties that involve our farming practice here. A lot of growers come to us and ask us, you know, what, what's the correct way to prune? And usually what we tell them is, you know, just to prune something every year. Uh, what we try to do is maintain our tree heights to 80% of the row width. So if we have a 20 foot row, we like the trees to be no taller than um, 16 foot uh, roughly. So a lot of times that means we have to prune down to 12 foot and then the trees regrow to about 16. Yeah, ideally we prune 15 to 20% of the tree's canopy on any given year. And we like to um, manipulate a different portion of the tree every year. And within our groves, we, we do a mix of different pruning within certain blocks. So we might take 10% of the grove and, and thin out th the number of trees. So in this case, we're, we're standing next to a, a tree that was removed about two years ago. Um, so we've actually reduced the density from, uh, this was 16 by 20, 16 foot in between the trees, 20 foot in between the rows. We've actually reduced the, the density from 136 trees to, to half of that. In older groves, uh, we might choose to, to thin out or remove every other tree on 10% of the total acreage within a ranch. And then on 40% of, of the acreage, we might aggressively top the trees and then on the other 50%, we might re remove a quadrant or take out a, a center limb uh, within the trees. So if, if we go in and do a, a variety of different pruning within the grove, the next year we do something totally different. So if, if we topped uh, a tree the previous year, then we will just remove a, a limb. If, uh, if we removed every other tree within a grove, then we'll uh, then we'll go in that, that following year and actually top that section. So every year we're manipulating a different portion of, of, the, of the tree. That's allowing us to mitigate the alternate burying tendencies of the avocado. It's allow, allowing us to produce budwood um, on certain trees for two years out, produce aggressive budwood. So the trees that we top this year, they're really going to come on uh, heavy two years from now. So what we're noticing is, is by pruning with this strategy, we always have a, a block within the grove that, that has you know, 25, 20 to 30,000 pounds per acre on it. And then we'll have other sections that might have 5,000 pounds per acre. The sections that we, we topped aggressively the previous year will have a light crop the following year. And then the, the sections where we removed one branch, uh, they might have 10 to 12,000 pounds to the acre on it. So, once you sum all of those, the, the combination of different pruning techniques up, we end up with somewhere close to 18,000 pounds to the acre year in, year out here. So ultimately we prune to increase our fruit set and our fruit size on each of the trees, um, whether it's that year or the year after or two years out. Um, and that increased fruit set and fruit size comes by way of light penetration all the way through to the floor of the grove. So when we cut out parts of the tree, we're getting more light into each individual tree as well as down to other trees along the base of them. And that's going to allow more flowering to happen on all sides of the tree, um, which in turn will have a greater fruit set. Um, this also gives us the ability to grow fresh, aggressive budwood, and um, which in turn will flower the year after and bring light into trees that are otherwise older or shaded out that can benefit from that rejuvenation of more light, more photosynthesis, more activity. We also prune to reduce water demand in some cases. If, if it's a short water year and, and we need to cut back, then, then we prune more aggressively to, to reduce tree demand. 
We also prune to, to obviously lower tree heights so it's cheaper to, to harvest. And in addition, you know, you're not bringing big ladders into the grove, so you're reducing your liability within the grove also. Um, as Blake mentioned, we, we prune to increase the surface area. So a lot of, in a lot of groves, older groves, uh, you see the trees canopy out and all the fruit is at the very top of the tree. Uh, when the, the strong winds come, uh, a lot of that fruit gets blown off. So we like to have uh, layers of fruit on the sides in the center of the tree, so on the tops of the tree, all the way around, so that when those, those strong winds come, the trees actually protect themselves and, and can keep more of the fruit that they set every year. As far as the, the costs associated with pruning, the pruning costs can vary dramatically depending on the type of, of pruning that you're doing and the age of the trees. Uh, when the trees are young, you know, you're going to do very minimal pruning, oftentimes just tipping, maybe maybe opening up the, the center of the tree to make it look like a, an open vase, but very minimal pruning the first three years or so, uh, and that the cost is very low for that. So in general, I would say pruning costs can run anywhere from $200 an acre up to, you know, $3,000 an acre or, or, or more if you're completely removing sections or, or stumping trees back to, you know, four to six feet tall, that, that's where it gets costly. But on average, we're probably spending somewhere in the realm of uh, $650 an acre on pruning, doing the, the variety of different technique, techniques that we have within the grove. So all of our pruning is done by hand um, with, with manual labor. Um, that's done, the majority of the work is done with pole saws, which are long chainsaws um, to get into some of these trees that are normally bigger. We also utilize some smaller hand chainsaws that can be operated with one hand, um, as well as manual pole pruners, which use a chain and a blade. Um, but like I said, overall, we use, we use pole saws, mo uh, motorized chainsaws to do the majority of the work. The small saws come in handy for smaller trees. Say you have smaller, younger trees and you're removing a, a center limb that may be down at waist level, it would be a little cumbersome to bring a longer pole saw in, in that case. One of the reasons we like to use the mechanical power pruners is because it allows us to do all the work from the ground. We don't have to bring ladders in and have guys with chainsaws up on ladders so they can reach up you know, 12 foot no problem with the mechanical power pruner and, and top the trees. Uh, those, those pruners can cut you know, trees that are 8 inches in, that, in diameter no problem. So that's the, the method that we prefer. For larger cuts, say we are taking a large center rim, center limb out of the middle of the tree or a, or a large quadrant, say a six or greater uh, inch diameter limb, um, it's often necessary to undercut the bottom of that limb so that, or cut, make multiple incremental cuts starting from the top so as not to rip off and strip a large piece of bark from the tree when that limb comes falling down after the majority of the cut is made. And so that's just common chainsaw practice and good practice for that. If we had flat terrain and um, you know, a, a grove that was opened up, then, then we would look to, to mechanical pruning. The only downside to that is a lot of times you're still going in there with manual labor, making additional cuts, and you still have to pull that brush out manually. So um, it is cheaper to make the, the initial cuts mechanically, but in the long run, it, it's, the, the total cost is you're not probably saving much by going mechanically. We like to prune between the months of February through April. Um, by pruning at those times, we're, we're allowing um, the fruit to be marketed. So at that point, all sizes are released. So we can start in February and, and pick a tree and then and cut those branches off and actually market that fruit, which will in turn pay for the, the pruning practice itself. Uh, another reason we like to prune at that time is it's, it's before the, the tree is setting fruit. Um, and it's early on in the season so that if we open a tree up, uh, we're going to get uh, sunlight into the center of the tree to allow budwood creation that season. So if you, if you delay and, and prune in, in midsummer, then you're, then you're losing that opportunity to create that budwood um, in the middle of the tree for, for that year. Uh, another reason why we like to prune February, March, April, I mean, ideally it'd be March and April in my opinion, is we've noticed that if your grove is susceptible to frost damage, 
then um, the trees that we've pruned in the winter time get hit harder um, than the, the trees that uh, were, were unpruned or left untouched. So um, that's another reason why we wait, like to wait until say March 15th in most areas, the, the frost threat is over with by that time and, and we get going. One other practice that is um, kind of controversial given that a lot of a lot of people are pitching high density groves. Um, we're actually, we're, we're not opposed to that. We feel that planting high density will get you into max production uh, a couple years earlier versus planting at a more standard density. But a lot of growers I, th I think are taking a, an approach where they're, they're not going the standard 109 tree to the acre density. They're not doing 400 trees to the acre, but maybe they, they plant somewhere around 200 trees to the acre. And like with this grove, um, and I think with any grove, if you plant high density in California, given the tools that we have, um, you, you need to have it in your plan to, to remove trees. You know, if, if you're planting 400 trees to the acre, and in my opinion, you're probably gonna need to remove um, some of those trees at about year five or six. If you plant 150 trees to the acre, you, you might wanna start thinking about removing trees Year, year 10 or 12. So that's kind of where, where this grove stands. Uh, we've, we've picked out certain areas, um, maybe our tightest areas or more, most canopied areas, and we've started in those sections and have gradually removed about 10% of the grove uh, year by year. Um, and eventually the entire grove will be half the density uh, within the next five years uh, to what we planted uh, the trees in, in 2003. We feel that the, the benefits of pruning outweigh the risks, so there's always a chance that we can transfer um, disease such as uh, sun blotch disease from one tree to the, to the next. If, if we know that we have sun blotch within the groves, then we're sanitizing our equipment in between trees. But all in all, we, we feel that the benefits of pruning uh, outweigh the risks. Okay, that was our first video. Um, we did have some questions. Ben, would you like to start addressing some of the questions? Yeah, we've got time for a few questions. Um, we actually have two right now. Um, uh, Ida asks, in any single year, how many combinations of pruning do you do? And how do you know which one is the most effective in productivity? Well, I, I think we I think we covered it, but uh, essentially we're within the grove. We're doing about three different types of, of different prunes. From we're we're topping certain sections, uh, we're removing uh, a limb or a quadrant uh, from certain sections, and then in other areas we might be thinning some trees out. So it, it's really dependent on the the size of your trees and the age of your trees and how how big of a problem you have. So um, a lot of growers. You know, they have orchards that are 25 years old and they come to us and ask the question, their trees are 35 foot tall. And the first thing you have to ask them is, you know, what, what are you trying to accomplish? Do you, do you want to try to get fruit at 12 feet? Do you want to slowly bring them down? Um, and depending on what their answer is, I mean, it, there's, there's different strategies for every grower. So in, in most cases, the grower will say, yeah, I don't really want to take a huge financial hit in the next three years. So we might recommend, you know, just taking uh, one or two large branches out for for three years or so, and then on that fourth year, make a final um, top on the central leader. But uh, yeah, so I guess I guess that somewhat answers the question. Yeah, thank you. Um, question came up. Uh, this whole program is going to be videoed and is, will be available on the California Avocado Society website along with the chats. So uh, if you don't catch it this time around, you can review it at your leisure later. So another question, do you leave the cuttings on the ground to compost or do you remove them from the orchard? And how do you yes. decide? Yeah, we like to leave all the, all the trimmings, all the cuttings on the ground. Um, a lot of the, the smaller branches, 
uh, we're just hitting with machetes and chopping it up. And, you know, it's great to, to cover up the, um, the fibrous feeder roots that are real shallow in the soil. Uh, the bigger cuts will bring a chipper in and uh, run the branches through the chipper and every, everything stays in the grove. We feel that, that it's uh, advantageous to the trees in the long run. So um, if you have a question, we've got another few minutes to, to uh, go through questions. If you have a question, raise your hand and we'll try and answer it. But otherwise, we've got a few questions here. Do you wait to see the flowers before you prune, or is the flower not relevant to your pruning strategy? What would you say your return in dollars and pounds is when you harvest the limb for a prune in February? So do you prune before you see the flowers, or does that mean anything? And yeah, the, it, it's really irrelevant to us. Um, ideally, you would, you would get your pruning done um, before the trees were, were setting um, and, and definitely before the trees flush out. So I mentioned we, we prune in February uh, through April. We're located in San Luis Obispo County. So our growing season differs from a lot of the people, a lot of the growers that are um, on the call right now. Uh, so you guys might actually start a little earlier than us and, and be okay still, but we, we would prefer to get uh, the pruning done before that flush comes out. Um, subsequent to to the flower. So here's um, another question. Do, have you ever done a spring uh, flush uh, pruning, which would still allow some good bloom time later on? So would you prune um, spring flush off? We, we haven't been, um, and I'm not saying that, that you shouldn't or you can't, um, but we've, we've chosen to, to just prune once a year and rather than make a lot of, you know, shaping cuts and more tedious, smaller cuts, we, we choose to make larger, big cuts that, that seem um, to accomplish what we're wanting. We're, we're wanting to bring in light. We're looking to, to farm light, not a certain number of trees. So um, making larger cuts seems sim simpler for us and it, it's a little bit cheaper too. It, when you're removing a single limb in February, what's what's the return, the dollar return on on that fruit in February? Well, you're definitely uh, the fruit that is being marketed at that time is definitely going to be discounted. Um, you know, historically the the prices are still still low in February, but the biggest hit that the grower takes at that time is usually they don't have the size. But we we just have to to turn a blind eye to that. And we're, we're confident that, that by removing that fr fruit, we're, we're helping produce budwood for future years and future crops. In addition, we're, we're creating better fruit size on the fruit that's remaining. Okay, here's, they really wanna know your secrets. Besides pruning, what other management do you do that you attribute the average 18,000 pounds per acre to? Well, I, I mean, we're giving the trees frequent smaller shots of water. All of our groves we've, we've automated um, and we've automated not only the irrigation and, and the valves, but also the, the fertilizer delivery. So we're also giving them small doses of fertilizer frequently um, through the growing season, typically March through September or so. They're getting small doses of calcium, nitrogen, potassium, zinc. Um, so I, I would say, you know, that has a lot to do with it, but just irrigation management is number one, trying to get the right amount of water to your trees at the right time. Avocados are, you know, they're like humans. They like to, to eat and, and drink uh, on a frequent basis. So we, we try not to let the interval um, go too long in between irrigations. I mean, typically we're, we're irrigating at least every other day. I know that seems very frequent to a lot of people, but um, we're, we're putting small amounts of water on and trying to keep that uh, top six inch, six, eight inches of soil moist. So that's, I think that's contributed to our success. And it looks like you're doing very little skirt pruning. Is this mainly because of the wind? That particular block that, that we videoed, um, we did not lift the skirts this year, but that would be uh, another practice that we've failed to mention um, in the 10 minute clip. But uh, yeah, that if, if we, if we lifted the skirts, um, then we would reduce the pruning in, a, in another portion of the tree. So that 
skirt pruning would add to the 15 to 20% uh, that we like to prune on an annual basis, but occasionally we will go and lift the skirts. I don't like lifting them real high off the ground. Um, and you know, that that's going to limit, limit potential production. I do like the fact that some of those lower, lower limbs help keep the, the mulch and the leaf litter in place under the trees. So that's important. Um, do you have any problems with invasive shot hole borer up there? We have not noticed it yet, knock on wood, um, but we're keeping our eyes out. Yeah, it's not there. Um, with a young tree, how long do you wait before you take out the central leader to create a base shape? Uh, usually, I mean, you could probably, it, it depends on how quickly they grow and, and your growing region, but I'd say probably by year three would be a good time to, to start selectively taking out branches. And in the first couple of years, we just do minor, minor tipping on the trees. Yeah. And after the big cut, you come back and manage the regrowth? Uh, that's a good question. I mean, we should, if, if labor was cheaper and more abundant and, you know, I guess the other reason why we prune in, in February, March, um, especially in slow County, April is because that that's when there is labor available too. Um, typically the harvest in that region doesn't get started till later. So we can keep the, bring the guys in in, in February and keep them busy for a couple months before um, they really get into what they want to do and that's harvest. Um, it, as far as the, do we, do we remove water shoots and, and uh, you know, shape that, that regrowth? We do not. If I was in another country with, with cheaper labor, um, I would definitely be doing it. But like I mentioned, we're, we're trying to, to make larger cuts in order to bring in broad swaths of light. So um, we'll try and answer the rest of these questions at the end of the session. Um, thank you for putting up with this introduction, uh, Blake and Gabe, um, and you look good in video. So with that, we're going to move on to um, David Hedrick, our entomologist from Cal Poly, and he's going to talk to us about pests and scouting, and um, thank you, Gabe and Blake. Thank you. Take it away, Claire. Well, hi. Uh, welcome to our avocado field day virtually. And we're at the Cal Poly Avocado Orchard that's on Radio Tower Hill that's adjacent to Highway 1. And what we're going to be doing today is focusing on monitoring for arthropod pests, insects, and mites. And there's two things that you're going to be balancing. One is accuracy, and the other one is time. Now, we all know that time equals money, but accuracy means that you need to take some time to make sure that you can find whatever's in these orchards. So you got to be thinking about, okay, what's going to be in there and how do I find it? Because you want to find it. You don't want to be caught by surprise later on. So you've got a couple of things that you can use. One is past history. So if you've got populations in here that you had last year or the year before, go there first because it's likely that's where they're going to show up again. But you don't want to just rest on your laurels. You also want to take into account new populations that might show up. So you're going to want to think about your orchard and think about the layout of it and kind of divide it up. It's easier to do it that way if you kind of divide and conquer and think about, okay, I need to look at five to ten trees in this area and I need to look at five to ten trees in that area. Then if you're thinking about, okay, I've got to look at ten trees, how long is that going to take? So if you're going to be spending six minutes on ten trees, well, there's an hour out of your day already. So you need to be thinking about, again, that's factoring into that balancing act of, of time versus accuracy. So if you can go to some place where you know you've had them in the past, you can check and see if they're there again, but then you're going to want to add in additional trees. And some of the places that you want to add in are going to be places like where I'm standing right now. And this is a really excellent spot to check for your two main pests, and that is persea mite and avocado thrips. 
And the reason that you want to check in a place like this, this location is excellent because we're along a dirt road and the prevailing winds are from the northwest, so they're coming this way. And this is also kind of a westerly, southwesterly corner. And as soon as that sun comes around in just a minute, this is going to be lit up and warm. So this is going to be one of the warmest parts of the orchard. So this is going to be a habitat that is perfect for mites because they like it dusty. And that's where you're going to find them. So when you're thinking about adding trees in and sampling for discovery, always look on a, on a roadside or an upwind side of the orchard. It's also going to be good for thrips because this is where uh, the flush is growing and the um, inflorescence, the flowering is starting to take place. And that's what they're going to be found on. So phenologically, this tree is just ready to go for the two main pests. That doesn't mean you preclude looking on the interior. You do need to go in on the interior and look at those trees too because there are certain things that are gonna be happening there. So you establish this pattern. Okay, I'm gonna divide the orchard up and I'm gonna look at a few trees. I'm gonna go and do that. And what, when I discover something, then I'm gonna to return to that. Okay, and from that point on, you're monitoring for population trends. Are they going up, are they going down, are they stable? Because that's what's gonna drive your decision making on whether they, you need to treat. But even when you found what you wanna look for and you return to those trees and you're keeping a, a tabs on that, you do need to add in a few trees every time, new spots as you're going along to make sure that you're not gonna get caught by surprise later on. So what we're going to do now is, is focus in on some of these major pests. And the first one is Persea mite. And as I mentioned, one of the ways to save time is to go to places where you saw it in previous years. And the way to do that is to look on the older leaves. And what we have here is one of those older leaves. And you can see the typical spotting that takes place when they've been feeding on that underside of that leaf. So you can see it when you turn over the leaf, definite spotting along the veins, but sometimes you can also see it coming through as a yellowing on the top surface of the leaf. And that becomes more evident as the leaf ages or as the feeding becomes more intense. So we know that we had Persea mite here last year. This is last year's leaf. So that means we need to look on newer leaves to see if we've got something going. So we take a leaf that's a newer, more recent flush and turn that over and we look for that white silvery patch and sure enough, right now, current, we've got new nests that are forming. Those Persea mites are under there and they are beginning their feeding process. Of course, you know that once this starts to build up, this leaf is going to sustain maybe enough damage to defoliate. And of course, that's the big issue. We don't want defoliation because then that leads to sunburn, whether it's on the branches or on the fruit. None of that is good for the tree. But there's two other mite species that you could encounter. One is the avocado brown mite, and the other one is six-spotted mite. So with avocado brown mite, that's the species that you can also be monitoring for right now through the spring and in, into June. And what you'll do for that one is just as you are scouring these trees and looking for the Persea mite, you're gonna look on the tops of the leaves for the activity of avocado brown mite. And again, it's a kind of an occasional pest. It's not something that you know is typically bothersome, but you do wanna keep track of it. Its feeding will also cause defoliation if it gets too, too out of hand. So it, it's a way to create efficiencies, kind of one-stop shopping. If you're gonna be looking at this tree and you're gonna be looking at Persea mite, also at this period of time, you look for avocado brown mite. Now, after June, you're gonna keep looking for Persea mite, but then as you get into later summer in August, you're gonna to wanna to come in and look for the six-spotted mite. And with six-spotted mite, they're gonna be on the undersides of leaves. You're already gonna be turning the leaves over looking for the um, Persea mite populations. And so you're gonna look for those uh, six-spotted mites that'll be feeding along the veins in a more diffuse pattern and not the clean spots that you see with the Persea mite. There's really not any good 
thresholds for mites. Uh, a lot of it is what's happened in the past uh, and your gut feeling. It's kind of called a nominal threshold. It's, there's not a formula for you. It's just what's worked in the past. And so you've got other factors coming into play, time of year, how the, how the fruit's coming along, the size of the trees, the health of the trees and all that stuff, and natural enemies. So you've got beneficial species that are in here that might be feeding on these mites and keeping those populations down for you. You can add predators in, and Gallandromus is one of the ones that's uh, commercially available. But what we have as far as an issue, has always been an issue with avocados, is the size of the tree and how do you get even coverage. Now you're not monitoring at the top of the tree, and you don't really know what's going on there as far as uh, pest populations. You're always down here and assume that what's happening here is also happening up there, vice versa. Nowadays, and this is something that uh, uh, my friend and yours, Ben Faber, might get into one day, and that is the use of drones and drone technology. This is something that we know that they're doing in almond orchards and other cropping systems to get good even coverage of predatory mites in these hard to reach places. So that's something to keep in mind. But another thing to keep in mind is some new work just came out in a publication last month from David Haviland, entomologist and extension specialist in Kern County. And he was looking for ways to better understand the predators of mites in cropping systems, tree systems specifically. And he found that these yellow sticky cards, you guys are familiar with these, look at that. Yellow and sticky, hence the name yellow sticky card. These can be hung up in trees and it was shown in this paper, David did a beautiful job on this, that they are differentially attracted to this yellow panel. And the species that he was particularly looking at were the stethorous spider mite destroyer beetle and six spotted thrips not six spotted mite but six spotted thrips those are both predators of mites and if you talk about efficiency trying to balance time and accuracy if you can have the bugs come to you that is way more efficient than you having to go find them and so this is new technology, it's not new technology, it's a new application of old technology. And I would be looking for uh, new information coming out from the Cooperative Extension on the use of these traps and how to look for those numbers and what's gonna be a good balance in terms of helping you decide whether you need to treat or not. All right, so there's a couple of miscellaneous caterpillars that you might be worried about in your area. Uh, one is going to be the Amorbia leaf rolling type. And with leaf rollers, again, when you're doing your monitoring, you're scouting, you're looking at the canopy, you're going to want to look for leaves that are uh, flat and tied together. Pull those apart and you're going to see that Amorbia in there feeding on the leaf tissue. Uh, the other one is the omnivorous looper, not the omnivorous leaf roller, but the omnivorous looper, different family. And they're going to be feeding on the margins of leaves. And so that's going to be something like what we see here that's the kind of damage that they will do. Uh, it's just, it's leaf damage. Yes, sometimes they can feed incidentally on fruit, but it's mainly leaf damage. And if you are gonna be looking for the uh, leaf roller, you look for those leaves that are tied together. But if you're gonna be looking for the omnivorous looper, you're gonna need to use another method, and that's this tap method. And it's uh, it consists of some really technical type tools here. You got a, a white plate, and some sort of a stick device. Now this is a tube that I got at the Staley's Ranch a couple of years ago. So you know this is super high tech. This is the best kind of tube you can get. So thank you Staley's. Now you just come along, you put the white plate underneath what you want to tap and you just strike hard and it dislodges them. They land and you can see what's there. There's some um, calculations that you can do. You can do 20 trees, do the tap tap on 20 trees. And if you get X number of larvae, it, that will tell you whether you need to treat or not. Now, most of the treatments can be pretty benign. You could put on BT or something like that. 
again, this is miscellaneous. It's, it's where you're just keeping track of it. Very rarely do you have to do anything about it, but just to raise awareness. And uh, the tap method uh, could also be something useful for thrips. And if you have an inflorescence and it's a lot of, of surface area to look at, you can take that inflor inflorescence and strike it and dislodge the thrips. And that gives you a really easy way to see the different kinds of thrips, whether they're predators, if there's predatory mites, if there's lacewing larvae, and if you've got avocado thrips versus western flower thrips, because that western flower thrips on this white plate doing that little flutter dance, super easy to pick up and see. Okay, Dave, thank you very much. Um, you were gonna show us uh, a handout that you've got? Yeah, there's a, a handout that I put together if if uh, scouting and, and trying to uh, look around an orchard for insect pests is is new or something that you you're not sure about how to um, start the process. I put together a handout. I guess Claire, maybe you've got that on the, the screen, and that'll be available through the website too. And uh, basically, it's just you know. Avocados are grown in such different places and, and, and some of them are on hilly areas like we just saw with the Mission Avocados, some are flat. And um, you, you really just need to look at the orchard, uh, determine that scouting is something that you need to do. And of course, there's a, a long list of benefits to monitoring and keeping track. But you know the key things are uh, not getting surprised, uh, knowing what's out there, uh, being able to make uh, proper decisions so that you're not responding or reflexively trying to put out large fires, but uh, taking things a little bit more uh, one step at a time. And uh, that is, that's the big benefit of monitoring. It saves you money in the long run. So map your orchard. Uh, one of the things that I'm really trying to get people uh, to use, I know a lot, I know it's it's pretty prevalent, but just making sure everybody's using mapping apps. You know, there's some general run general ones out there like Agrian, uh, but get some kind of mapping device on on your tablet on your phone so that you can keep track. So down at the bottom there, um, uh, bottom right hand corner, there's a an image of what it looks like if you if you're using the Agrian app on your phone, and you really need to look at the the orchard setting. Here I've got two examples: one it's hilly and one it's flat. Divide it up and just start picking places to examine trees. And Ben and I were chatting earlier, and it's like the obvious first place you got to start is on those upwind sides, especially along dirt roads because the main pests that you're going to have, these, these mites and thrips and stuff, they come in on the wind. They blow in. And that, so they're going to hit that, that upwind side of those trees first. But guess what? So are the natural enemies. And so that's where you really can understand what the dynamics are that are going on. But as I said before, you got to get in and, and check out what's going on in the interior too, so that you're and, you know, not caught uh, unawares by pests that may be building in those uh, in those orchards. Okay, here's the classic uh, question. What treatments do you use to get rid of mites and how do you apply? Yes, yes, I know, I know. I know, I know. kill, kill, kill. Kill, 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 spray, spray, spray. <laughs> so look, the thing is that nowadays we have so many different growing philosophies that you kind of have to figure out where you are on the spectrum. Are you going to be full chemical or are you going to be full biological? And the reality is, is you're never going to be one way or the other uh, because uh, you're going to slide up and down that scale, depending on what's going on that year, depending on what's going on in the orchard, what's going on marketing wise, you know, and so you will end up moving up and down that, that scale uh, pretty consistently year in and year out. So one of the things that you do need to know is, 
how natural enemies are coming into play. And the natural enemies are, are there doing the work for you. Uh, many of them are doing it for free, free of charge. And, uh, but there are some commercially available natural enemies like the Gallandromus or the Neocelius that are the predatory mites. Now, those guys you can pay to put in, and that's good. And if you're going to be paying, you need to know what, what natural enemies are already there and what needs to go in on top of that. Are there formulae for that? No, that is a learned through experience kind of an approach. Now, in terms of chemicals, uh, you got to go uh, sort of looking at the agrimec type of, of an approach. Uh, the guidelines are there to provide uh, uh, just a series of different kinds of chemical approaches. Some are incredibly harsh and some are a little bit more environmentally friendly. Some involve oils, other things. So you, you have to look at the, the spectrum of chemical approaches and decide if that is going to be economical for you and realize that a lot of those chemical approaches are going to be harmful to the beneficials that are already there. And then, then prepare, like if you're gonna go in and just do like a scorched earth thing, okay, then it's gonna take time for the, those beneficials, the naturally occurring ones and the ones that you purchase to get back uh, on track and providing that population regulation that you want. Beneficials do their best work when the populations of the pests or the prey that they're after are low. That is a given, okay? And so as long as you're maintaining these low numbers, that's fine. If something gets out of control and you have a really big blow up, okay, well, then you may need to come in with something stronger to get the numbers back down. So then subsequently the natural enemies can maintain those pest populations at those lower densities. So it's, it's, there is no strict, easy rule. There is no strict you know, just recipe for success. The only way that you can really get a handle on it is by monitoring, keeping track of what you did last year and the year before to inform what you're going to do going forward. You know, it's all based on, did that work last time? Okay, let's try that again. Did it work the time before? No. Uh, how do you develop a threshold? I see that come up in the chat. Okay, so nominal thresholds are basically gut instinct or based on what you have learned from previous experience. And so you will, if you have done a good job in keeping track of your pest population densities and the, and the relative numbers of the uh, nat, uh, pest populations and the natural enemies and the ratios there, and you've seen how much of a pest population you can handle density wise and not have any effect on your bottom line, that's your threshold. But you have to have those numbers. Well, when we went out and monitored, you know, it was like eight leaves out of 10 had perseamite, but gosh, we didn't have any uh, defoliation because it wasn't intense enough and, and we didn't have any sunburn. And so there was no economic downside to that. All right, that's a strong data point that informs basically a threshold for you. Thank you, David. So you'll, you'll be around at the end, right, to answer some more questions. I'm you're, here. You're building. So thanks. And we're going on to Johnny Rosecrans, who's the farm manager at Cal Poly, to talk about how do you build a berm. Take it, Johnny. Hi everyone, my name is Johnny Rosecrans and I work at Cal Poly in the Horticulture and Crop Science Department. We have over 110 acres of ag land, 80 of which are orchard crops. We have a unique mix of citrus and avocado varieties, stone and pome fruit, and next year we plan to plant nut crops as well. My main responsibility is to oversee the day-to-day -day operations around the farm with my focus being on orchard crops. 
which is why I'm here today because I was asked to talk about berming and since we recently replanted this three and a half acres of avocados on berms, here I am today virtually to show you how we accomplished this. So a little bit of backstory behind this block. Three or four years ago, we started seeing significant decline in these trees. And upon further investigation, I did some soil sampling and sure enough, um, it was positive for Phytophthora root rot. I did some additional potholing in this block and believe it or not, 12 to 14 inches down, I found bedrock or hard pan. So this poor block was slowly starting to suffocate um, because the water couldn't move beyond that, uh, that hard pan. And so uh, even further more, I started asking around and this block was never deep ripped prior to planting. So you can kind of see the long-term effects of what happens if you don't deep rip and you're growing in uh, a hard pan layer. Um, it just turned out bad for, for this poor block. So we started having discussions with Tim Spann, with the CAC and Professor Dr. Garner, and Tim Spann offered up the idea of replanting this block um, as the fifth and northernmost uh, block for UC Riverside's root rot resistant trial. So we were all on board with that. We thought it'd be a great opportunity to do some research in this block. So um, we decided, yeah, let's pull the trigger on that. And so we all collab co collaborated together. And uh, last year we ended up planting this block as the part of that uh, root rot resistant trial. But I am not here today to talk about the trial. I was asked to talk about um, how we replanted this block with an emphasis on berming and what it took to accomplish this and the steps required to do so. So let's take a look at how we accomplished this. And just a quick disclaimer, I unfortunately didn't capture video or pictures of the entire process start to finish of this planting and berming and all that. So some of the videos and or pictures that I show in this presentation are from other projects, but I'm using them because it's the same equipment that, you, that we used. And so it'll give you the gist of, uh, of how we got things accomplished. The first step was an obvious one. We had to remove the existing trees before any of the land prep could begin. This was accomplished by using a D8 dozer, which allowed for quick work by pushing over each tree. The trees were then ground up using this excavator with a thumb attachment, and this massive horizontal grinder made quick work of things. Within hours, our poor orchard was nothing but wood chips. After spreading the wood chips around the field as best we could, it was then time to deep rip. Using the same D8 bulldozer with a four foot shank on the rear, the entire three and a half acres was ripped. The field was ripped lengthwise and then cross cut at a 45 degree angle. And remember this block had a hard pan layer 12 to 14 inches down in areas. So deep ripping this block was crucial to breaking up that layer. Our next task was to break up the larger clods of soil created by the ripping process and smooth out the soil. So we decided to make several passes with the disc. It was finally time to start the berming process. We used a lister bar with two plows set at 20 feet apart to mark lines where each berm would be created. This tractor was outfitted with a GPS unit to keep the lines perfectly straight. Unlike the previous planting that was bermed cutting across the slope or horizontal to the downward slope of the hill, we decided for this planting, we would berm the block parallel with the slope to promote a faster draining environment. Once the lines were cut, the real work began. A D6 cat with a six-way blade slowly started pushing soil into rows. After several passes on each side, the long lines of soil started to resemble berms. For the final and finishing touches, we used a motor grater to flatten the tops of each berm and a pole scraper to smooth out the drive rows. 
we were pretty happy with how the berms turned out and we ended up planting this block in June of 2020. Here are some of the photos. So there you have it. I hope you enjoyed the presentation on how we replanted this block with the emphasis on berming. Again, my name is Johnny Rosecrans. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. So Johnny, what did it cost to build those berms? Um, I did the math um, besides tree removal. Um, so just the deep ripping, the disking I did myself, but I actually incorporated in the cost of uh, the quote, uh, the disking and the layout and mounting it. It was anywhere from about uh, 4,500 to $5,000 per acre. Okay. Um, Question, I mean, this is it. What are the benefits of berming? Why do it? Why <laughs> well, we really, wanted, we really wanted to, to berm to promote faster drainage in the avocados. This particular block, uh, the previous block had phytophthora root rot. The berms were um, going cross um, or horizontal with the, the slope. Um, and, uh, you know, we were encountering um, Kind of a shallow um, with, with the hard pan, the the water just wasn't penetrating, and so um, we did we deep ripped and decided to berm them parallel with the slope just to promote some faster draining soil. So here's a, another good question: Are there guidelines for uh, the steepness of the slope for berming? <laughs> Is there a, a point at which it's not valuable to do it? Um, I don't know if I have that answer. You you might be able to answer that better, Ben. Okay, <laughs> I, I don't like to do this because um, you know basically on on flat ground you can do this. You can afford this machinery. And number two, um, when you're on a, a slope, you, you do have good drainage typically. And um, you have control over water, okay? It's how you put it on, your frequency and that sort of thing. So generally speaking, when you're on a slope, you know, you're controlling the water and, and, you're, and you should have fairly good drainage. So the, the, be, the benefit of, of berms kind of falls apart once you get above about a 15 to 20% slope. And th then it just gets too expensive to do. Although when you go to Chile, you see them <laughs> burning these incredible mountains. Mm -hmm. um, is there, okay, is, is there any research on the yield benefits of burning? So if you compare yield, you know, pre-burming and yield going into the future, what do you expect to, to what do you expect to see in the yield effects? Again, that's something I'll be honest with, and, and I don't know that I have that answer. Um, this particular block is going to be a 10 to 20 year uh, study, um, and it's a root rot trial that um, you guys will hear about uh, after me. But, um, you know, s some of those answers might be uh, or some of those questions might be answered, uh, you know, looking five, 10 years in, into the future. Okay. I apologize. That I don't think I have that in, information. It, really, it becomes a question of root health and tree health. And if you don't have good drainage, you've got a poor soil. Uh, berming is the only way to go if you're going to grow avocados, and for that matter, citrus as well. So it, you know, it's almost a question of do you have trees or don't have trees. So what, what's the economic benefit of a berm? Well, it's 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 really important. So how can we build a simple berm in a smaller area than three acres? What if you have a berm, what if you have 
a quarter of an acre for some simple way. I mean, so um, the technique still would apply to smaller acreage. You might just be using smaller equipment. Um, the, the outfit that we used um, has quite large equipment. And so they brought in, you know, the, the big guns, but uh, you could easily um, berm smaller acreage with just a smaller tractor if, if you can. Yeah. And so here's another question. Why build berms with steep sides rather than a more gradual sh sh chevron shape in, in, in the orchard? It's hard on poor pickers like me. What, what was the question, Ben? Why are they so steep? Why are the berms so big? On this particular planting? Correct. Um, we, uh, we just kind of discussed it with the, the contractor and uh, decided to, to push them up. Um, we know there's going to be some soil settling. So, um, you know, there's, there's going to be uh, a little bit of, um, you know, ladder work if we, if once the trees get taller. Um, but, you know, we see that in some of our larger orchards anyways. Um, so how are you going to protect these berms from erosion? You've got mm -hmm. cropping in between. What are you I do. Yeah, I do have, I planted a cover crop. It was a uh, forage mix, um, is mix of barley, oat and wheat. And, uh, so, I mean, I wish we had more rainfall to, uh, to test our, uh, our, uh, our runoff, but we did get that one storm that uh, produced five to six inches and um, the, the entire area held up really well. I was happy to see um, that there wasn't, there was minimum erosion. Um, we did install some drain inlets that captures um, some of the water and moves it off site. Um, we have the unfortunate um, the the unfortunate uh uh thing where uh the, the highway drains right into our orchard so we we're able to capture that water and move it off site um but between um the uh the drain inlets and the cover crop i was pretty happy with uh with how the orchard held up um seeing very minimal erosion yeah it is surprising did you consider ripping down the middle of the berms after you built them in order to improve drainage in between berms? No, I did not. I mean, that soil was bermed up and it was, it was pretty fluffy, if you will. Um, and so I didn't feel that there's a need to, uh, to put a, a rip down the center. Is there a width to height ratio of a berm? Is there a <laughs> dimension you want to Man, all these tough questions. I, I don't know. I, it's really your, your own design, right? And, and what, what you're thinking of. I've seen smaller berms. I've seen wider berms. But um, keep in mind kind of what your ultimate uh, tree shape is going to be and, um, you know, and design it to that. So here is uh, two questions. Same, uh, from two, or here's the same question from two people. What about mounding versus berming? Why, why a continuous berm versus an individual mound for tree? Um, you know, I, I think uh, a continual berm just kind of sets up the orchard a little bit better. Um, I don't know, maybe you can um, um, manage it a little easier than just creating, you know, one mound per, per tree. Um, you know, with, with a with using a tractor, it's easier to, to push soil up uh, and berm it in a line than berming it in a circle. Yeah, it really is, it lends itself to, to machine creation and, and it's, it's a whole lot cheaper than individual mounds. Um, you also create a much larger volume of soil for the roots. Remember avocados are shallow rooted and, and if you're just you know, putting those roots into a little mound, when they first started doing this elevated planting back when oh, George Goodall and Bob Burns and a bunch of people were doing it, it'd blow over because there wasn't enough mm -hmm. rooting in the, in the mounds. Whereas with the continuous berms, you, you've got much more volume of soil for roots to be in. Um, is the, the 
are the dimensions dictated by the need to mow in between? So is your mower designed? I, I did keep that in mind somewhat. Um, the drive row is about eight to nine feet wide. Um, and I have two different mowers that um, will work. I haven't mowed the cover crop yet. So um, that's certainly uh, a consideration um, when designing your berms um, is how your, your tractor is going to fit down there and, and what width you have for your tractors and your mowers and implements and all that. Uh, did the $4,500 per acre include the removal of the old trees? Were you worried about using the root rock trees as mulch? Well, it, uh, it, it was designed to be a phytophthora root rot trial. You're going to hear about it in the next talk with Dr. Garner. So we actually wanted the pathogen to stay in the soil. So, um, you know, most times you're not going to want that. But in this case, we did want the pathogen. <laughs> yeah, the researchers are terrible. Um, <laughs> what type of irrigation emitters are you using on the new trees? Yeah, um, so I, I have three drip, drip emitters per tree. They're a half a gallon a piece. Um, and I plan to slowly convert them to uh, a micro sprinkler um, down the road. Um, is there any concern about the trees settling below grade once you know the, the, the berm soil settles, which would cause some problems with um, crown rot? Yeah, I, I'm not concerned uh, about that. The soil is settling. Um, the tree might settle a little bit, but um, I would hope they'd kind of settle together. Um, as of uh, today, I, I haven't noticed any trees settling any deeper than um, what the berms have been doing. Okay. And did you apply gypsum? I did not. Good, probably didn't need to. So with that, uh, Johnny Rosecrans, thank you very much. And uh, you'll be around to answer questions at the end, I hope. Sure, I'm okay. here. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So our, yeah, our next speaker is Lauren Garner. Dr. Lauren Garner is uh, a horticultural teacher at uh, Cal Poly, and she's been working closely with avocados for years, and she's going to talk to us about the avocado root rot trial that is at Cal Poly now. This is Lauren Garner at Cal Poly, and we are here at our rootstock um, trial that we are running with Patty, Mary Lou, and Peggy from UC Riverside. And so this is one of multiple sites where we are looking at the effects of these different rootstocks on Hass avocado trees. So San Luis Obispo here um, is our northernmost site that we have going these trees trees were planted just last year and so they've been getting well established the goal the major goal of this trial is to try to take a close look at these root stocks that are already known to provide um, to most likely provide resistance to Phytophthora. And so as the majority of you already know, um, the that pathogen is one that is a huge problem for avocado growers throughout the world. We have a large number of tools in our toolbox that help us to try to deal with root rot from preventing it, um, some methods of chemical control, uh, control of irrigation, um, at trying to make sure that the roots um, don't stay too wet and the tree becomes more likely to be infected, or we've provided an, an environment that really allows the pathogen 
to grow well or to spread easily through an orchard. Um, and then we've had um, in our industry a relatively long history of being able to use root stock that are resistant to Phytophthora, but that resistance is somewhat limited. And so there's been an additional long history of avocado root stock development and breeding at UC Riverside. And so they now have several um, root stock that they're hoping will soon be available for commercial uh, licensing and use by our industry. And so one of the things that we are doing here is we have three of those root stock and we have DUSA, which is one of our industry standard root stocks. They've all been grafted over to Hass Avocado. And so we have them here in this orchard so that we can evaluate um, not just their potential resistance to Phytophthora, but also the effects, any effects that these rootstock might have on Hass Avocado, whether those effects be positive or negative. And so um, we've had, like I mentioned, we have these trees in, they got planted last summer. We did our first evaluation of the trees approximately two months later in August. And just last week, we did a second evaluation of these trees so that we now have data on their height, um, the trunk diameter, um, and also their general overall health. For the rootstock that we are evaluating, though the primary objective of the study is to um, uh, confirm that they are indeed resistant to Phytophthora, there are a lot of other potential benefits that these rootstocks could have. And so we have evaluated our trees for issues such as um, tip burn due to salinity, heat damage that could occur, um, how much they are flushing, how much bloom is actually being produced. It's obviously too early to be evaluating them for yield. Um, and we are, but we are very excited that we've already been able to find a few differences um, between our, um, between the different root stock. And so one of the things that we have been able to find is that we've got um, one of these new root stock has actually resulted in trees that are taller than those that are on the DUSA root stock. We also were able to find a significant effect on perseamite damage to, um, to some of our trees. So we're interested in continuing to take a look at that. We are fortunate to have um, a very good water up here. So the trees that are at this particular orchard aren't really being challenged with respect to salinity. But I know that at some of the other sites that is being evaluated and some differences in salinity um, tolerance have already been detected. Um, and we did actually, um, unfortunately, have them challenged by heat. Um, we uh, reached 120 degrees on one of our thermometers here on campus um, during the last um, summer. And that's an awful lot um, for, well, everybody, um, but also for the avocado trees themselves. But fortunately, um, we had very um, little heat damage. And to um, so far, based on our analysis, we haven't seen um, a difference that's related to rootstock. Um, we've also been very fortunate with respect to, um, to mortality. Um, the trees have all um, survived the initial planting, and we were fortunate enough to get um, really good deer fencing up around the entire orchard so that we haven't lost any just due to, to normal attrition. Um, one of the other things that could be very exciting um, for us is if any of these rootstock actually allow the trees to be just healthier and more vigorous in general. Um, I'm sure that the majority of you have already heard about laurel wilt disease. And though we are fortunate to not have it in the state of California at this point, um, we do have to anticipate that it 
it might get here along with the beetles that actually carry it and could cause avocado trees to get laurel wilt disease. And it's been found that trees that are healthier are much less likely to be fed on by the beetle and therefore less likely to get laurel wilt disease. So though we hope to not have these trees challenged by that particular beetle and disease, we do feel that it could be helpful to the industry if we are able to find um, anything that would indicate that any of these rootstock might uh, enable the trees to just be healthier and resist more pest fresh any other pest pressures that might be coming our way. So this land has actually been in avocados for a long period of time. And so since we've been managing this area, we found that we had a section that unbeknownst to us previously was just much more shallow um, than we thought it was and not draining as well as we thought it was. And so when the trees began to wilt, um, we mistakenly thought that they they were in need of more water and what had actually happened is that the trees had become stressed due to the the land being much more shallow and they had it became obvious to us later, a little later on, that Phytophthora had started to become a factor in the tree's health. Um, before we were able to correct that, we were um, we had one of um, the more um, wet, rainy seasons in recent history, and so the Phytophthora that had been partway up this hill spread very quickly down the hillside um, during during that rainy period. Um, as it turned out, um, we, um, we ended up meeting up, uh, Johnny Rosecrans and I ended up chatting with Tim Spann and Ben Faber at one of the last California Avocado Commission and Avocado Society meetings to be held on Cal Poly's campus. And so I still remember asking Tim Spann, hey, do you happen to be doing any um, Phytophthora rootstock trials and he asked me if I could use several hundred trees. And so it turns out that this was just a, a really fortuitous setup. It's not a whole lot of, in fact, I assume it's no um, growers are actually happy to find out that their um, trees have Phytophthora, but there's really no better place to actually test um, Phytophthora resistant rootstock than in an area that's known to have a history of Phytophthora. We, in order to know that these trees are resistant, we, we really do have to know that eventually they're going to be challenged with the pathogen itself. And so um, we were, um, as, I, um, as I know that uh, Johnny Rosecrans has explained, the orchard got put in um, in this same area um, not just because we needed to replace the trees, but because it was just a really excellent win-win. Um, at our site here, um, we are actually fortunate that we were able to set up this orchard in a way that is both um, commercially um, appropriate in terms of the spacing of the trees, the way that they're put up on berms, the way they're being irrigated, um, and also that we have the trees um, in in, in rows based on um, uh, based on which rootstock they are. So the trees are in in groups of eight, nine, or ten trees, all of the same rootstock in a row. So that even as this orchard gets older and the trees might start to root graft with one another, we will still be able to detect effects of the different rootstock on yield and um, other aspects of growth. And so we're fortunate that that we were able to set this up in a way that's both very statistically robust so that we can get good data to report back to the industry, but that it's also commercially applicable, that we're not looking at 
one tree of one um, on one rootstock next to another tree on another rootstock where those um, where we might have different confounding factors occurring. Um, so what we do have out here um, is um, at nearly 400 trees that are in here. The trees that we're able to take data off of that are off uh, that are on the three uh, rootstock that we are testing against DUSA um, are also being being, um, we also have additional trees that were donated by CNM Nursery that are available so that we don't have, say, unused space or gaps within a row or between rows. So that again, our results are hopefully going to be um, fully commercially um, applicable and useful to our industry. Um, and so that's um, one of the things that we hope will make this project um, as you useful to the industry as quickly as it possibly can be. Well, thank you, Lauren. Um, let's see, I just lost my <laughs> I just lost my screen. <laughs> um, I I can see the Q and A if you'd like me to yeah, please, that please, for now. Please, oh. please jump in. Gotcha. So um, I see a question asking um, what are the rootstocks being used, and and so they have these uh, very fancy names like PP thirty. <laughs> Um, and things like that. So the our control um, is DUSA. So the a really common rootstock that's being used in industry. But the three other rootstocks um, are currently um, they're just named in a way that's you know useful to the folks at like to me and to the folks at UC Riverside and to the folks at Nursery. <laughs> who um, grafted these trees. And so, but if anybody does happen to be familiar with these studies, um, it's, we have um, PP 35, 40, and 45. So they're um, three of the, what we, what are seem to be some of the more promising um, rootstock for Phytophthora resistance. And as, um, and they're also of all of the other sites that are currently, um, studying these rootstocks um, that have these kind of similar trials in place. Um, these are um, these three rootstock cultivars seem to be at all of those sites. So we should be able to make really good comparisons. Um, ben, do you did yeah. you change so your way there? <laughs> why not mulch these new trees? Oh, why not God. mulch the berms? Got it. So some of that um, might be to Johnny to answer some of that question, um, but I would agree with Johnny that the berm seem to be holding up really um, nicely at this point and where we don't actually see a need for mulching. If we did want to mulch them, we would have to do so with, with a lot of care, like to make sure that the mulch didn't end up um, like at the base of the tree um, or anything like that. I, as I know that part of our assumption is that we'll get part of the benefit that most avocado growers do that the, uh, that the leaves are gonna end up providing us with a, a nice leaf layer and uh, on the top of the berms. But I think if we were to find that because of the, the berm height um, or the wind or something like that, that the leaves really aren't going to do the job, then I'm, I'm sure it's something we might consider to try to keep our evaporative losses down from that area. Johnny, does that sound about right to you also? Couldn't have said it any better. Yeah. Um, we, we have tried to mulch certain blocks. In fact, that lower block that was dying from Phytophthora, we tried to mulch it and uh, I mean, it's a lot of work. One, you got to secure um, the, the wood mulch. And then uh, there's quite a bit of labor involved in uh, either wheelbarrow barrowing or, or um, you know, using a loader to, to dump, you know, buckets of mulch onto the, the area. So there's, there's a lot of labor involved. So how are you going to control the weeds on the berm? <laughs> 
you're looking Quite at the same. <laughs> <laughs> well i actually have gone through there several times uh with a, a little gator sprayer that i use uh i was petrified because i didn't want to kill any of uh you know any trees and uh have to uh you know give the bad news to dr garner or you know anyone involved so I was very, very um, cautious about spraying, um, but we have uh, brought in a labor crew to uh, hand weed and we plan to bring in uh, additional labor crews to do so. I think uh, Dr. Garner has secured some funding through her grants to bring in some, some labor just to hand weed around them. Yeah, yeah and I would also say that the cover, I, I realized the question was more about the the berms on the berms themselves but the cover crop is really doing a nice job um suppressing the weeds um between the rows also so i think that by um working diligently to keep the weed pressure down um early in the growth of the trees until we get a nice canopy cover on those berms i i think that's gonna pay off for us in terms of um uh, being able to make sure that we know that we're saying not hopefully um, not really in, having any kind of increase in like the weed seed bank that we um, might already have um, and that we'll be able to again make use of the the canopy cover um, on the berms and the cover crops between the rows to really help keep the weed pressure down as much as possible. Um, so this is for both of you. Uh, for staking the trees, why use PVC rather than a wooden stake? I think the, the wind on that on the hill was a major factor. We had um, other stakes, but we were concerned about just the mechanical damage um, that would come from the trees rubbing against like wooden um, or metal stakes and that PVC has worked well for us um, previously um, and uh, Johnny, was there any other aspect to that other than PVC not being the like most difficult thing for us to actually get staked in? Um, well, you can see what a professional speaker, um, she could <laughs> articulate much better than I can. Um, but for me, I, I believe I was uh, asking around and uh, Josh Garner with Mission I was asking him and he said, oh, I use PVC. And so we decided to use PVC, but Dr. Garner's answer sounds a lot better. It also and, builds a stronger trunk too. And Johnny is also being, uh, he's, uh, he's being very gracious about that because before we changed out the stakes, um, we were, you were, we were looking at the trees and noticing that there was definitely some issues um, with like needing, they did need the support, that's for sure. And you can see even with the staking that they're still getting a good bit of wind um, out there and a good bit of movement, which as Ben points out, if you can get them staked, but staked so that they'll still move a little bit, then you can get a really strong trunk. If you stake them too, um, like too tightly and the trees don't get to move around very much, then you don't get um, as strong a trunk growth that you're gonna really want in place later on in the life of the orchard. Okay, you two will be around at the end, I take it. So thank you, Lauren, thank you, Johnny, and we're gonna move on to Charlotte de Kock, who's a soil scientist at Cal Poly. And she'll be talking about soil health and cover cropping and all those good things. Hi, I'm Charlotte de Kock. I'm a professor in soil health and fertility at Cal Poly and a certified crop advisor. Last year, we started a project to study the effect of cover crops on uh, soil health in orchards. This uh, project includes two field trials, one out in Itna Valley and one here on our Cal Poly campus. In the field trial in Itna Valley, we have three treatments. We have the control treatment, which is the typical practice where the alleys in between the trees are left um, uh, fallow, so there's bare soil. 
In um, the two other treatments, we're testing different variations of cover crop management. In one of them, we have a triticale cover crop, so a non-legume cover crop. In the other one, we have that same triticale with um, an inoculation of mycorrhizae. So that's out in Enna Valley. Here at Cal Poly, we have also three treatments, but they're a little bit different. We have uh, similarly the control with the bare fallow. We have a um, treatment with the triticale, which we're standing in right now. But then the third treatment is a, a cover crop mix that includes legumes. So in that treatment, we have 10% of triticale and then a mix of three different legumes. We have fava bean, field pea, and common fetch in there. All right, so as I said, we're standing here in the uh, treatment with the triticale cover crop. And one of the things you can see here on the ground is the mulch. So the common practice um, in this orchard is to prune in fall and then mulch all these prunings and just leave them on the surface. This has been really nice for this orchard because we're on a Salina salty clay loam soil here. And um, after it rains, the soil can get really muddy. The mulch helps with um, accessibility to this orchard after um, heavy rains. So we didn't really want to diskin that mulch to be able to prepare a seed bed for the cover crop. And this year we tried if we could just see that cover crop directly into this mulch. You can see that the cover crop has nicely germinated. So we're really happy to uh, be able to verify that we can uh, seed that cover crop directly into that mulch instead of having to disc it into the ground, adding that additional disturbance and uh, lowering the accessibility to the field because it gets really muddy. We're here in a different plot of the same triticale cover crop treatment and you can see that it looks a little bit different here than it did in the previous crop. What we see here is a lot uh, more dense coverage of the soil by that cover crop. And this is caused by actually uh, germination of some of the seed from last year's cover crop. So we could see in the previous plot how that cover crop was nicely growing in these straight lines, which is uh, a result of how we seeded that cover crop with a drill seeder that puts the seed in these nice lines. Here we see that the plants are much more scrambled. So that seed that was produced last year was um, basically germinating so this is an interesting observation because it provides opportunities for growers to potentially let their cover crop purp purposefully go into seed so that you don't have to reseed and buy seed every year. Um, one thing to pay attention to though is that um, with crops that are frost sensitive, you don't want your cover crop to be too tall when there's frost at night because that tall cover crop can increase the risk for frost damage. So here you see an example of a legume cover crop mix that's thriving. This is what we would hope the uh, cover crop treatment with the legumes to look like in the lemon growth. So as we continue improving soil, hopefully this is where we can get in a few years from here. So here we're standing in front of one of these newer orchards on our campus. I'm standing in front of an olive grove and you can see that the cover crop in this olive grove is doing a lot better than the cover crop out in the lemon orchard. Before this olive grove was put in, they put, uh, they had the field fallow for a little bit, but it was a green fallow. They put in a cover crop that served as a soil builder with a lot of legumes, a lot of good roots. And um, you can clearly see that when you start with better soil health, your cover crop is also going to do better. When it comes to avocados, there's definitely also opportunity to use cover crop to improve your soil health. When you're talking about a mature orchard with a very dense canopy, you're probably not gonna be able to get a cover crop in there because there's not gonna be enough light coming through the canopy for that cover crop to be able to succeed. In these mature orchards though, you get all that leaf material that comes onto the soil and this is actually a really good source to build your soil organic matter. Where the cover crops can play a role is um, in the younger orchards where the canopy hasn't completely closed in yet. And um, here on campus, uh, we just put in this new avocado grove on a hill 
And there's a cover crop growing, and that cover crop has already been uh, doing a really good job at keeping the soil in place and preventing erosion in this young orchard um, with this very heavy rains we've had a few weeks ago. We are just in our second year of this research project right now. We're collecting a lot of data on different soil properties, also on the trees. We're collecting yield data. We are in the process of analyzing all that data and we will definitely make that available to you as soon as we have it. I would love to hear from you if you have questions about cover crops, if you have certain experiences you would like to share, if you have comments on the video, please don't hesitate to contact me. My email is popping up on the bottom of the screen and so I am really excited to hear from you. So <clears throat> thank you, Charlotte. Um, you have a handout that you wanted to discuss, correct? Yes, <laughs> that's right. Yeah, so the, the video mostly shows what, what the cover crop looks like in the in the different orchards really on campus with a highlight on the research trial where we have the uh, statistically sound uh, replication of the treatments where we can really assess what impact that cover crop is going to have. Um, I also made a ha handout that will be available to you later with a little bit more on the benefits of cover crops. So many of you might be, be familiar with many of these benefits. So uh, that cover crop, is going to put organic matter in the soil and then help with um, improving the soil structure. So that helps with infiltration. It holds your soil in place after a heavy rain. Uh, and it, it doesn't only help with infiltration and, and draining that soil better, but better soil structure also helps with um, holding on to more water. So you can build the capacity of your soil to be able to, uh, to hold on to, to that water. And really, I think cover crops are a really good way to improve the health of your soil. Soils are happiest when there's plants growing in them. Um, on uh, the nutrient side, the cover crops can also help out if you, of course, put a legume in there, you're gonna add some nitrogen from biological nitrogen fixation. On the other hand, if you have a cereal cover crop, that cover crop is going to be able to uh, scavenge and take up some of your residual nitrogen, maybe, um, and so prevent that nitrogen to go um, into the surface waters or the groundwater. So there's there's a lot of different potential benefits of cover crops, and you know, depending on the type of a cover crop you plant, some of these benefits are going to uh, be expressed more than than others. So uh, selecting what cover crop you want to grow is, is an important step in, uh, in, in choosing to do cover cropping. And um, so this fact sheet was put together based on, on much of uh, what we have experienced growing these cover crops at Cal Poly right now, but also based on advice and recommendations we've received from Ben Faber during the process of starting this project, as well as um, recommendations from Valerie Bullard at the Plant Materials Center in Lockford, where they are testing a lot of different types of cover crop species. And so for avocados, uh, Ben recommended uh, to um, really choose something that's not going to grow too tall, especially in the context of risk for wildfires. So there's a few uh, a few recommendations there: a brome, a zorro fescue, or a bird clover, or three good options um, for avocados, um, especially in in the context of the risk for wildflowers. And then there's some more recommendations on that on that fact sheet. Um, in addition, there's also uh, a, a number of links to resources from the NRCS. There's some really good uh, guides and databases of all kinds of different cover crop species uh, based on the hardiness zone you're in, and based on the different kinds of benefits they can bring. And I plug these links in there. Uh, in addition, 
there's also links to um, the website of the Healthy Soils Program. So this is the uh, this is a program by the CDFA that funded this research project. But there's also a portion of that program that's called the Incentives Program that supports uh, basically um, grants for growers to plant cover crops. So that might be an interesting option to look into. And then there's a link to the NRCS EQIP, um, which is an, another program by the NRCS to get financial support to start uh, cover cropping. Okay, here's a question for you. When you have a dry winter or erratic rainfall in the rainfall in the fall, how do you get the, the, the cover crops to germinate? Oh, that's a that's a great question. And um, so we started this uh, this project two years ago, and we we have had two really dry winters. And I see Johnny smiling, and he probably is thinking about you know how I was kind of stressed out to get this project going and not being sure if this cover crop was going to grow or not. So um, in in both these years, the cover crop has come up even with the erratic winters. Um, we, we have uh, waited. So some people seed the cover crop in the dry soil. We have waited until after the first rain because it's a little bit easier to get uh, that, that, that seed deeper in, in the soil with the drill seeder. Um, and so in both years, we have waited until right after the first rain to put it in. Uh, in other orchards on campus, it, Johnny has put it in before the first rain, just in the dry soil. And on all the orchards on campus, the cover crops seem to be uh, coming up. Um, and I think Johnny can probably elaborate a little bit more because he's been cover cropping for a long time on campus and probably gone through a lot of different weather patterns. Yeah, it's, <laughs> excuse me, it's been difficult the last two years, the driest two years that we've seen back to back, I think in recent history, um, in an ideal world, uh, as uh, Dr. Dukak mentioned, um, we would get you know a quarter inch of rain in October, and then we would prep the soil, maybe do a, a little disking, um, and and kind of fluff that that soil up, and then you can uh, seed it after that. Um, and in which case, you know, you'd hope for another rain shortly thereafter um, to germinate the, the seed. But um, the last few years, yeah, we've we put in cover crop seed um, in November and it just sat there, you know, for two or three weeks, um, you know, and I, I didn't know whether the seed was going to germinate, but we've had pretty good re results um, seeing germination um, even, you know, three weeks with no rain. Are you monitoring soil moisture content to see the impact of the cover crop? And there's been uh, uh, observations that there is increased water holding capacity with the cover crop. And then you have the, the competition for, um, from just evapotranspiration with the cover crop. So is there, a, is there an idea of, does it add or subtract from the water that would be available for the avocados? Yeah, in this particular trial, we're not monitoring moisture, but we're hoping to be able to do that in the future. Um, we, um, let's see, when you think about, when you look at sort of research that has been published, it goes a little bit both ways. Some of them see lower moisture content uh, under the cover crop, some of them uh, see the other trends. So the data, the data seems to be a little bit all over the place. Um, when it comes to research uh, uh, data, but I think um, it, I think the, the water holding capacity is a different metric than soil moisture. The water holding capacity is how much water soil can hold on to it, if you completely soak it and you see how much water is left. Uh, the moisture content at any given time is a combination of the water holding capacity uh, in combination with the evapotranspiration, right? So it, sometimes, you know, when you compare research studies, um, you know, it's, I think it's important to know that uh, water holding capacity is a different method, metric than the actual moisture content at any given time in your, in your orchard. And I, 
I would assume it depends on sort of like the timing and also how long that that cover crop has been into place. I don't think you're going to significantly increase your uh, water holding capacity in just one year after cover cropping. So uh, I, I would I I would expect that there is sort of like a, a you know a time effect where maybe at first you you might have a little bit of competition for. Uh, water and after a while you improve your soil properties to the point where you might be doing better. Yeah. And, and I think that one of the things that that ties a lot of these questions and the answers that Charlotte and Johnny have provided just ties things together very nicely is that the, the cover crop is probably doing the most to limit erosion and runoff during the rainy season. Um, and then that's also when you're gonna have the least um, worry about uh, uh, higher rates of evapotranspiration. And so you're getting some of those benefits in the winter with relatively low risk with respect to evapotranspiration. And then um, Charlotte, I will admit that the I, I got to like look through the right part of my glasses to be able to see that bit of the handout, but I believe that you mentioned mowing um, like in the in the spring. So you're getting the, the cover crop, then you could start having the benefits, some of the benefits from the organic matter of it being mowed, but not have that evaporative um, concern as it's really starting to warm up. Yeah. Okay, well, Charlotte, thank you very much. And so this is open, open mic now. And the first question is, what type of drill did you use um, uh, to, uh, in the no-till um, cover crop area? Uh, it was a Schmeiser seed drill. It's four foot wide. Um, and I don't remember how many drills it has. I think it has six. Think eight. Eight. What's the cost to install a water system on four acres of property? <laughs> um, I don't have that number right in front of me. I could, I Probably could get it, but ten thousand dollars that in front of me. Yeah. Probably be about ten thousand um, dollars. So. I'm, I'm going to go back and start asking some of these questions that we skipped over. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, side question. Noticed your use of flex hosing. I had problems on my ranch using flex hose. Rodents and coyotes chew into them for water. Do you have these problems or, or do you have a deterrent? Uh, Dr. Hedrick likes to shoot him, but, uh, <laughs> no. um, yeah, you know, I have experimented with rigid PVC as the risers coming out of the ground. Um, I decided to use the flex hose, um, in this particular block. I've been pretty happy with it, but, um, we see rodents, um, chewing on not just the flex hose, but the drip tube as well. So that's been an issue in the past. Um, we have uh, seen significant damage um, to our drip lines um, in certain areas. And uh, that was maybe four or five years ago at the peak of the drought. And actually, uh, Dr. Hedrick and Dr. Garner came up with the idea of putting uh, um, little tubs of water at the ends of each row um, to actually have a water source for the rodents. And, uh, Believe it or not, it really worked well um, to prevent those rodents from chewing on our irrigation system. Yeah, to Is be clear, that was David's idea, and I'm the one that talked Johnny into giving it a try. And I still remember um, that he uh, he looked back and he said, "I can't believe it! I saw one of them drinking um, out of the tub of water, but it it, it feels wrong." to help the pest to get some water, but we were spending, we had um, like our student labor spending so much time fixing and replacing irrigation. And then once the, once the, it, cause we mainly had a squirrel um, an issue and mainly tree squirrel um, issue. Once they had a, a water supply, 
then we didn't have to spend so much money and time fixing a, an irrigation system. Yeah, it was just giving them what they want, you know, and, and sometimes that works out, especially because we were, that was the tail end of the drought and, you know, they were all hurting. And I had checked with the county on, because it was gray tree squirrel. And of course that's a uh, uh, fur bearing mammal and it's got some restrictions on take. And, and I checked with the county and they were, they were just like, no, you, we're not going to let you trap or do anything like that. So it was, you know, hands were tied. And so it was just a matter of, well, if that's water that they want, let's just give them to them in a way that's not going to, you know, be harmful to us. And sure enough, it worked. Here's another berm question. Does berming uh, reduce leaf litter due to wind? Uh, reduce leaf litter? Correct. I, I, I would... I would think it would be the opposite. Um, you might see more leaf litter being lost on berms than oh, yeah. that's uh, flat the question. Yeah, do you lose more on the berm than on flat ground? I I would assume so. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, I've seen that also on some completely flat um, avocado orchards near foothills. So I, I think the wind is is like your biggest issue there, whether it's on berms. Or if you've got skirted up trees in a windy area, you're gonna you're gonna lose leaf or that way. Um, yeah, definitely. I agree with Johnny on that one. Okay. Uh, did you do any soil disinfestation to to reduce phytophthora before planting in this situation, or did you want to? No. <laughs> you wanted to have a lot of pressure. You know, I had a question for for you, Lauren. You, you say one of the rootstocks reduced the Perseamite population. How, how does that work? Okay, I did not say that. Um, oh. We, we monitored. Um, so what happened is we were, were in the orchard to do one of the data collections. And we noticed when we were at the north end of the block, we noticed what seemed to be a fair amount of Perseamite damage on the leaves. And so we didn't know if that was um, a, a factor of how close that part of the block um, was to a fair orchard that had had a fair amount of perseamite pressure that year, or if there could possibly be a rootstock effect. And so um, it was actually not even the first senior project um, that came um, out of this study, uh, out of the, this rootstock study, is that a, a student who had already taken um, entomology with Dr. Hedrick um, checked on all of the UCIPM work to know how to like really like spot per se a mite damage, how to rate it, and then just scored all of the trees for per se a mite damage. And there wasn't an effect um, related to like how far the trees were from other mature blocks. There was a, a one of the rootstock that had um, a higher perseamite um, damage, if I'm remembering that correctly. Um, but then uh, the issue and the reason we'd want to look for that is that some of the same, some of the things that make the rootstocks different from one another could potentially confer something to the scion that may make them, you know, more or less um, susceptible um, to certain pests or other diseases, or maybe more likely to say potentially, say there might be flushing out at a slightly different time. So we're interested to learn more, but I know that Patty um, is also looking to see what other kinds of insect or pathogen pressure might potentially be affected by this different rootstock. So yeah. what we've got at the moment. That's Patty Manosalva at UC Riverside Plant Pathology. So here's some suggestions coming from the crowd for squirrel control. I have found wrapping aluminum foil after the first chew seems to be a helpful deterrent, maybe. And then it, somebody else says, I've started using IBC totes with an auto water bowl and spread them over the grove and that has reduced line damage so far. Not 100%, but way better. And my next step is to cut and use old 
strip line to cover the micro lines. That's a good idea. I, I once sprayed um, a jalapeno juice in a black latex paint on, on lines and that stopped coyote damage. <laughs> so, all kinds of crazy things out there. Um, uh, are, are you sampling for root rot in, in the orchard or are you just uh, rating trees according to damage? We we have we have sampled um, once before we sampled right before planting, but that time of year, um, Patty was telling us is is just really not the best. It's it's so hot that it's not really the best time of year to sample um, for it. But um, uh, we're going to be working with our colleagues from Riverside to to sample on a regular basis um, for for Phytophthora. So yes, that is def that's a of the things we need to keep doing with the project because like I mentioned you you don't really know how well you're assessing um, the um, the resistance to Phytophthora if the trees never get challenged with it at all so we we still need to find out how heavy that pressure might actually be at the moment yeah uh, this is for David Hedrick. Um, what do you think of the IC, uh, UC IPM website for recommendations about thresholds and uh, identifying pests of avocado? We lost David. There we are. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So I'd say one of the things that the UC IPM, uh, the, the pest management guidelines did a few years back that was strategically good was to go to the year round. Uh, approach to managing pests and diseases. And that really gives uh, the growers that kind of big picture perspective. And it, it, it's such a huge help. And if you go uh, on that particular one, because the old one is still there. So make sure you're going to the new one and get that year round picture of what's going on. And you'll see the charts there that, that kind of walk you through January through December and what to do. And a lot of it is, is, is good, but remember that site has to serve as a general guideline for what is, you know, 700 miles in latitude from San Diego to wherever Chico, you can't cover all the bases for everybody. So you have to take it for what it is, a general guideline. And that is where some of this stuff more like what we're doing here and, and what we do on campus is teaching and training how to um, validate what you're seeing on those uh, recommendations, validate them for your area. And so if there's a degree day model, get out there and validate that. Just use some sort of biological marker, a biofix, and see how it adds up. Um, there's, there's ways to do that. Um, the, the other thing about the, uh, current IPM guidelines for avocados is the way they've broken up the pests. And I really like that because you've got the ones that are most significant concern. Then you've got the secondary ones that, you know, it's like, well, we talked about it already. We don't have prolific shot hole board here. We don't have lace bug here. Uh, we don't have the neohydatothrips here. So we have to look at that from the perspective of, okay, what's the most important and what do we have? So that is a really good way to get people to kind of filter and recognize what are they going to be their real significant concerns. Yeah. Okay, well, there are a whole bunch of pruning questions in there that disappeared. I wonder if Gabe and Blake answered them. They disappeared. I don't know. But yeah, yeah, I've been answering them. Yeah. So we're coming to the end here, and this is all going to be on the Avocado Society website, along with the chat questions and answers. So um, with that, I'd like to thank everyone. And Claire Balant, do you have anything to say? Uh, I have one more thing to add, um, which is that Dr. Nick Babin here at Cal Poly is doing a survey of avocado growers. I'm going to put a link in the chat right now, um, right here. And I will send it to the attendees. Um, 
He is conducting this survey to understand grower perceptions of risk and the barriers to adoption of conservation practices in California avocado orchards. Um, he would like to use this, uh, all answers will be anonymous. This voluntary survey will help inform policymakers and agri agricultural advisors on farmer perceptions of risk and conservation practices. Um, I will post that link also everywhere the recording is, but um, on behalf of Dr. Babin, um, we really appreciate if you would fill out this survey um, at your leisure. Thank you. So, so thank you all. Enjoy your avocados. And thank you everyone. Great seminar.